Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this event, Art Protest Value, a panel discussion. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, we look forward to an exciting uh, discussion. We we'll have a panel discussion, but also we're going to uh, have time for the audience to have you all to have your questions as well. We look forward to having an open uh, back and forth. Uh, I'm Ian Condry. I'm a professor in global studies and languages. I'm actually head of the department for the semester. Uh, I'm also part of Comer comparative media studies uh, as well as women's and gender studies. I've been teaching here at MIT for about 14 years. I'm a cultural anthropologist by training and I study Japanese popular culture. Uh, and one of my projects is anime. Uh, so I'm quite interested in visual arts, the way visual arts speak to the times, speak to politics, are engaged with changes in the economy, uh, but perhaps above all the way the arts uh, can transform our thinking uh, and give us new ways of understanding ourselves, understanding society, understanding our relations to each other. Uh, and I hope that that's the kind of thing we can have a discussion about today. Uh, art is one of those things where it doesn't exist uh, without the viewer, uh, without an audience, uh, without a kind of interaction. Uh, even if that interaction perhaps is only in the artist's multiple personalities, or even if it's in a smaller community. Uh, but one of the things we want to think about today is the way that art moves into society, moves into broader communities, and has a kind of impact uh, that can really change the way we think about the world and the way we engage with the world. Uh, so that's the theme for today. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the series that this is part of, uh, but I also want to uh, give a, a couple brief announcements of upcoming events. Uh, that I have coming up, uh, and I'd like to, people to know about them in case you're interested. Uh, one is, and so, anyway, that's something to look forward to. It's a shameless plug, uh, but I wanted you to know. Uh, also, this is another project I'm involved in. Uh, it's happening tomorrow here at MIT at lunchtime. Uh, we're calling it Bridge Wednesdays. Uh, it's a time where people can come together, make signs, listen to music, stand on the speaker's stool, engage in dialogue uh, about politics in this troubling political moment. Uh, it's not actually, we, we are open about what kind of politics, how you want to talk about politics, but one of the things <coughs> that people are saying is that in order to get beyond the kind of divisiveness uh, and we have right now, uh, we need to find ways to have dialogue across political boundaries. I mean, some of this, and I, I don't just think of this as red versus blue, uh, but the diversity of political movements are out there. How can we work together? Right? How can we find ways, uh, which might not mean being under a single umbrella. Uh, maybe there are new models out there. Uh, one of the ideas is to create a space where people can have this kind of dialogue, share information, make a sign, make a button, publicly display the kinds of things you're interested in, and meet other people, uh, either who have the same interests or different interests. Uh, and the idea is to have a kind of weekly mini rally uh, in the middle of the infinite corridor here at MIT, uh, 12.30 to 1.30. Uh, at least this Wednesday and next Wednesday we'll do it there. We may move around to different areas of campus. Uh, you don't have to be there for the whole hour, but I encourage you to come by if that sounds at all interesting to you. So Bridge Wednesdays, check it out. Uh, we'll, see, uh, we'll see what happens uh, and, and how that goes. So I wanted to, I wanted to let you know. OK. Um, allow me here. I just realized what I'm going to have to do here. This is, not, this is going to be a little trick. Uh, sorry about this. I need one more, I need more screens. That's my here we go. Okay. Got something here. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, this is part of a series uh, called the Dissolve Inequality Series, uh, and the idea of dissolve is that around MIT we do a lot of work to solve problems. We solve problems, solve this, solve that. But one of the things that's clear to me is that you can't solve something like inequality unless you dissolve the structures of power that reproduce inequality. Uh, and so then I think while we're trying to solve things, we should also be dissolving things. 
uh, dissolving the boundaries between each other, dissolving the power structures that reproduce massive inequalities, uh, and find a way uh, for us to break through these walls around us. So this is part of the Dissolve Inequality uh, series. This is the Visual Arts Summit. Uh, very exciting uh, artists and uh, writers here to talk about their work. Uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to introduce each of the uh, panelists. We're going to show some of their projects, uh, and then we'll get uh, to the Q&A as well. Uh, I'd like to begin by introducing uh, Sharon Loudon. Uh, there's Sharon on the end. She's an artist, educator, advocate for artists, and editor of the Living and Sustaining a Creative Life series of books. And I should mention that part of this uh, event today is a book launch. Uh, the book just came out, uh, and we'll be hearing more about the book. Uh, the book is available for sale as well, so don't miss your chance uh, to get this great book. I've been reading it, it's really fascinating. Uh, Sharon graduated with a BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and an MFA from the Yale University School of Art. Her work is held in major public and private collections, including the Whitney Museum of American Art, the National Gallery of Art, and the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. She has taught for more than 25 years and is currently the senior critic at the New York Academy of Art, where she organizes a lecture series interviewing luminaries and exceptional individuals in the art world. Please join me in welcoming Sharon Loudon. We'd like to show a little bit of your work, Sharon. So, did you, might you talk about some of this? Let's see if this will work. Next slide, where will this go? There we go. Um, so I make massive installations. This is uh, an installation that I did not that long ago and actually in Minnesota. It's made of um, aluminum and um, suspended to be able to change a, an entire environment. And it's highly reflective rare aluminum from Canada so that people see themselves in it and expands the whole space. Um, we can go to the next one. And this is a detail of it. Uh, so I generally like to make work that um, I love beauty. I think beauty is underrated. And I think that um, I, I love to make beautiful, uh, suspended, um, mostly suspended installations, but that compress an environment. So it's sort of uh, contradictory, it's something that is inviting and yet claustrophobic, um, both. I like to have both the same um, a relationship in, in, in my installations. But I also do drawings and animation and paintings too. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. This is just a commission that we just finished. I do a lot of public art too. This is in Houston. Um, I, this is for a lobby for TIA CREF, which, is, um, which has an amazing art collection actually in Houston. And they wanted something to uh, have, be in dialogue with architecture. So again, the same kind of feeling of maybe something suspended that is weighted and yet reflective. So when people walk in, they see themselves and it's interactive, so they're part of the piece and expands the, the whole lobby. And that's, uh, that's an outside view of it. That's about, I think it's about 3,000 square feet. Oh, I, actually, I'm not sure how many square feet it is. <laughs> actually, I should know that. I just got finished with it. But like two weeks ago, um, but it's suspended 33, 33 uh, feet in the air. So this is an animation I just finished. This is a still from an animation that's going to be premiered at the National Gallery of Art on May 6th. So uh, generally, I love to work with gesture and line, these anthropomorphic beings, and I think that the installations are that too, where they come together to create environments, and the same with my animation and drawings. And so for me, and that's another still, for me, these little forms have character, they have characters, uh, characteristics that are these goofy, um, hopefully beautiful, uh, animated forms that have a whimsy and a life to them. And that, when I put together the aluminum uh, in these environments, I'm hoping to get that feeling across as well with the individual pieces of aluminum by coming together as one group. That's it. Great, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. All right, uh, please allow me also to introduce uh, Julia Kunin. Julia Kunin lives in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, she earned her BA uh, from Wellesley College and an MFA from the Mason Gross School of the Arts at Rutgers University. 
Uh, Julia's work is represented by Sandra Gehring Inc. Gallery, where she had a solo show entitled Les Guerrillaires. I'm not sure if that's the right way to say it. Les Guerrillaires <laughs> in 2015. Uh, Kunin has exhibited nationally and internationally. She was a Fulbright Scholar to Hungary in 2013 and has does work in Hungary as well. She's also a member of the Women's Action Coalition and is a founding member of the activist group We Make America. Please join me in welcoming Julia Kunin. <laughs> we have some images okay. of Julia's work as well. Okay. Um, I'll speak about this, but there actually was another image mind? that I wanted to see first. Okay, which I'm sure, which... Uh, uh, because it will set the stage for the conference. Great, right. so yeah. Right. Right. So this one, this one. Thank you. Sure. Okay, is this working now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the reason I wanted to show this piece, it looks really great, so large here, but it's actually spans about six feet, and these saddles hang from the ceiling at the height at which you would imagine yourself climbing on them. I made these in 1993, and at that time I did a whole series of pieces based on saddles that were uh, covered with red suede. And this was during a time of identity politics when the dialogue was very, very exciting about queer theory and when my work was shown in that context of queer theory. And the reason that I wanted to show this piece is because at that time, in the early 90s, a bunch of us were very, very conscious um, about creating lesbian culture and making it visible. We were interested in lesbian visibility. And this is something that I believe has disappeared from our culture. It's something that I want to bring, bring back into the dialogue. Uh, this was on the cover of a book called Damn Fine Art by New Lesbian Artist, which I think is kind of humorous as a, you know. But um, it did, that book did bring a group of us together. Um, the, author, Cherry Smith, actually served as kind of a unifier of a bunch of us lesbian artists and the community actually grew from that. And then Harmony Hammond uh, came out with a book in 2000 called Lesbian Art in America, which continued that. And since then, Catherine Lord has written books and other people have continued to write about um, queer theory. And I wanted to highlight this because I worked so much on the subject of sexuality and gender, and at one point in about 2002 thought, okay, I'm done with this, it's over. And uh, I went on and pursued some similar concepts of eroticism, but through ceramics and using other metaphors, animals as metaphor. And now I've come back full circle to this concerns about sexuality. I don't know which image you have next. Is this, a good one? this is the most recent, but I will talk about it at okay. any rate. So it's not the trajectory historically, but. Um, this is kind of a big jump, but I have been working in Hungary. As Ian mentioned, I was a Fulbright Scholar there, but I've been going back and forth since 2010. And it was there we've spoken about the fact as a group that when you're working in a foreign country, you become so much more hyper aware of what's happening in your own culture as well. And I was sort of literally woken up again to the level of homophobia and sexism that exists in most places outside of, in many, many places outside of the United States. And we live in a bubble in New York, we were talking about, where we don't have to worry about that as much. So I was really sick and tired of being invisible there. I lived there for seven months and pretty much been in the closet for almost the entire time I've been going back and forth to Hungary, which now is almost, you know, almost ten, seven years, seven years. So I started incorporating imagery of women into the work. And I won't elaborate on it. It's much more it uses modernist tropes, and it's influenced by socialist art that I was surrounded by there. So you can go on. Okay. Let's see here. Let's try this one. Um, this I'll talk about briefly in, in relation to the following work. I started to make portraits composed of symbols. And I brought back a symbol that I'd used in the 90s, and that was at the keyhole, which is a very kitschy kind of symbol that represents sexuality. But I was using it at the time to kind of convey a sense of voyeurism, and one that you could be a voyeur and you could experience pleasure at the same time through this uh, motif. So the concept that I was working with is creating a portrait through a stack of symbols. Um, this is also recent, so we're going back and forth 
Uh, and this is really intentionally wanting to make something that's really humorous and has a lesbian content at the same time. I think humor was sort of something that was always important in my work and comes and goes. And um, I was definitely looking at, you know, pop art and uh, having a lot of fun with it. And so this is a large wall piece, large. Well, it's not as large as this. It's probably about three and a half feet tall. And I was intentionally trying to create a sense of a figure through, again, this stacking and doubling and use of symmetry of breasts and eyes and such. And you know, you have to pay homage to Judy Chicago. You have to pay homage to those 70s feminists. This one um, predates that. This was the first work that I did that is composed of a stack of symbols where the keyhole is predominant. And this really is very, to me, reminiscent, um, as I look back, to Marston Hartley's portrait of the German officer who was his boyfriend at the time, who he made, and he made that painting in 1914. And it's coded. You see the initials of the officer. You see the age at which he died. You see the um, cross. I wish I had an image here that he earned. And it, it to me, is such an important piece because it conveys the coding of homoeroticism in, within a work. And I think that that's something that I continue to do. And even if a work isn't obviously political and hitting you over the head, I think it's very important that it has those meanings coded within it, even if it's just um, appreciated by a very small audience. So that's what I want to say about that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. All right, we have one more panelist to introduce. That's my notes here. Um, Brad Vartanian, welcome. He is editor in chief and co founder of Hyper Allergic, a, a blogozine, which I just learned this word today. Thank you, blogozine. Uh, a publication he created in 2009 in response to the changes in the art world, publishing, and the distribution of information. He writes and lectures about contemporary art, performance, multiculturalism, politics, the internet, literature, and visual culture. Anything else? That's it. <laughs> oh, no his, other skills. As if. Right, as if. Okay. His curatorial interests are focused on theories and practices of decolonization, and he prefers to work in unorthodox spaces. Vartanian Light launched the Hyperallergic Podcast in 2016, which travels around the globe to uncover the evolving world of art. Please join me in welcoming Craig Vartanian. Wow, look at that. I don't have that much to say. I think that's a, but I will tell you an interesting little fact about this. Uh, most people don't know, but all the editorial images on our homepage are golden rectangles. Just so you know. It was, it was one little geeky move I had to pull. Tell us what Golden Rectangle, not everybody might know. Oh, I don't know. I sort of. Well, um, a Golden Rectangle essentially in like the history of art is it sort of has to do with sort of the way the, the sort of the, the image is sort of organized um, in the proportions. And often even in old master paintings, things are placed in places that it, generally it's like two thirds, the two third rule or whatever. It's sort of two thirds in the photo or one third. Yeah, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's what I'm going to tell you. That's, <laughs> that's it. And here, yeah, so there's the... Is there any way you can talk about Beacon and how you oh, started yes. Hyperallergic? Oh, so it yeah, started... It was... Yeah. It was the, thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> the origin. Um, uh, so we started Hyperallergic in 2009. My husband and I, Beacon Geikian, um, because we essentially found that we were gravitating online for our information and we didn't find good sources and, and engaged... Um, opinions and, and internet native discussions um, and so we had to kind of create it and part of it was also as a writer um, I found that my I loved writing online more than print or anywhere else and people weren't paying so we had to figure out a way <laughs> for to get some writers paid even if it was nominally at first and then slowly it's sort of gone up but that was kind of the objective so it was as much a publishing venture to figure out how the economics of the art world work I know we're talking about inequality, which is perfect because that's exactly what you discover about the art world when you're trying to do something that's financial is you realized how really insane certain aspects of the culture are. 
Um, one of the things, for instance, he created an, ad, an online advertising network that the first like online arts network, and we have 12 different sites in it. Um, and one of the things he discovered was like advertising and marketing in the art world is not really, doesn't really make sense. Like for most, outside of uh, higher institutions of higher learning and some museums, most of it makes no sense to marketers or advertisers. Um, and, and so these were the sort of things that we've slowly been revealing. And I feel like we take, we use that and we sort of reveal a lot of the hidden networks and the, the infrastructure of the art world and how we see things and how we understand visuals and all these types of things. So I think that's sort of the, the short description of what we do. Great. Thank you. Craig Vertanian. <laughs> All right. Uh, I forgot one important part of my uh, introduction, which is to thank our sponsors. Uh, yes. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, <laughs> our sponsors, Paul Ha, thank you, of the List Visual Arts Center. Thank you for helping organize, and uh, my department, Global Studies and Languages, gets a little credit too. All right. Uh, good. Uh, let's hear. Uh, a little bit about the book, Sharon, That's and great. then we'll get to our, our panel. I, too, I also want to thank Paul and Ian for having us. This is really important. And this uh, event is actually part of a 95-stop a conversation tour. And I'll explain what that is. So as you just saw my work, my work is aesthetically driven, but there's, I think aesthetics can be, can be political. And the kind of work that I do um, as an artist is not just making my work. It's also um, uh, working for Creative Capital, Joe Mitchell Foundation. I worked for the NEA last year. I feel like I'm active as an advocate, as Ian said, for artists. And so in 2011, I had, I was on, I moderated a panel called uh, How to Make a Living With or Without a Dealer. 400 people showed up at that panel and I said, well, it's really disturbing that you're here, dependent on that system. And great that you're here, because maybe you'll leave here with thinking, differently. So from that, my publisher was in the audience. You never know who's in the audience. It was amazing. And she came up to me, a rep for my publisher, and said, we really want you to write a book. And I said, uh, I can't write an artist statement. I can't write anything. I'm not going to write a book. But she said, what would you want to do? And when I got out of college, I got out of college at $115,000 in debt um, in 1991, which I paid off in 10 years. But at the time, artists weren't sharing and giving a lot, and nor are they enough now. So, I, and also at the same time, I don't think the public understands how artists are integral in society and how much we're needed and how we contribute to the well-being of others. So I started, I did this book, Living Sustaining Creative Life, that went on a 62-stop book tour. It's gonna be in its seventh printing in the next two weeks and it sold over 8,000 books and in 18 countries. So after that, my publisher said, hey, want another contract? I said, sure. So um, I was thinking about it for the last couple of years anyway, and so the second book, The Artist as Culture Producer, came about because um, on the tour, I noticed that when I said that an artist was a culture producer, the public would be like, huh, what does that mean? But when I would say, this is an artist, they would think of Van Gogh, and Van Gogh died in 1890. So there's some problem there, because I think that it's very important that to, to note that artists have multiple hats, and we give in all different sectors. And so part of these books is to show, in the first book and the second book, I have 40 artists in each book, that they just give their lives, how they talk about their lives, like Julia is actually from a political family, she's an activist, um, she's one of the 40 artists, and then Harag wrote the foreword to the book, because he's a major, in my mind, a important, unique, very important, I said that already, thought leader, who uh, believes in artists and setting a trail for all of us. So I, I think that um, I'm interested in bringing people forward as examples of who a contemporary artist is today. I'll just describe really quickly the finances behind it, at, talking about equity, and money, which is really important. So my first tour, we, we just uh, paid for it partially by a Kickstarter campaign, uh, $6,500 that got us going. But we were really in the red from that tour, me and my husband. My husband is, is my partner in this. He's right here, and we do this together, Vincent Vallega. Um, so anyway, the second tour, I thought, you know, I'm gonna try to create a standard with this second tour. 
I wanted to partner with different venues as I wanted to partner Paul and his wife Eva, who I love his I love her work so much, um, to be able to collaborate with different venues and have conversations all over the country and this time all over the world. But I needed money behind it. So there are three sources of money for this. There is uh, we raise money as uh, we're not now a fiscally sponsored entity through New York Foundation for the Arts. We also received a grant from the Fa Ford Foundation for $50,000 to go to marginalized communities all over the world. And then the venues actually support every event so that every time an artist or somebody walks on stage, all their expenses are paid. Because we should be paid as creative individuals to show that that's just as important as a scientist as, as a, I don't know, as a lawyer, as anybody, to be able to come and speak and share knowledge. So to date, we have uh, raised now, actually an hour ago, I've increased the budget, I mean the, the fundraising to $190,000 we've raised, me and my husband, ourselves. And then in addition to that, both of my books are um, shared projects. I share all the royalties with all of, my, all, of uh, all the artists or the contributors in the book, and everybody gets their own copyright. So I'm trying to make a statement through these books as a platform for conversation, and every every and also in addition, um, this second book uh, is part of a case study, so that will be published and distributed through nonprofit organizations. And in fact, actually, I wanted the NEA to take it, but I don't know if they're going to be able to take it anymore. <laughs> Sadly, so, uh, but we had, we, we were in conversation, right. right, we should talk about that. But anyway, thank you for allowing me to show that with you. Hooray. Wonderful. All right, well, thank you uh, for that. I'll join you up here. Let me see. Test, test. test. Yes. Um, uh, thank you. Well, let's get the discussion going. <laughs> <laughs> this is very exciting. Uh, one of the ideas is that art, artists and art is, can be a change agent. Change agent bring about change, engage with politics, engage, engage with society. Can you talk about some of the important ways you see that happening? How can we think about art and change? I know there's many examples of it, but if there's something that seems especially relevant, meaningful, I'd um, like to start, yes. Um, you know, I think we often think of art changing things being like sort of a painting in a room or like some kind of art project. Um, but I think a lot of the change ends up happening s systematically. Like, I like to think of the art world as a microcosm of society. So if you can change, and, and it's much more manageable microcosm, so if you can create a model that's smaller scale, that can scale and sort of have a life elsewhere. Um, you know, and I think artists enact change in different ways. Um, uh, Sharon's probably tired of me telling the story, but I, this I, I think is an example of like how an artist can take a stand that has a ripple effect. Um, in the case of when I was interviewing uh, the gallerist Jack Shaman last year, he mentioned that when he took on Carrie James Marshall, who was a very prominent artist, you know, one of the most prominent African American artists in the country, Carrie James Marshall made the stipulation that he wanted to build a, a, a black collector base, and that Jack Shaman was going to help do that and that was part of the deal and you know it was amazing what ripple effect that demand by an artist had into in this commercial venue because now Jack Shane is sort of so well known for a lot of African American artists also and he does it sort of effortlessly it's not like it was a plan but it was like how when an artist or any cultural producer takes a stand there's a ripple effect you know, and another example, I think, is in the case of Occupy. One of the things that a lot of people may not realize, but a lot of the early people who participated in Occupy were performance artists. And why is that? Why does that make any sense, if at all? It's because a performance artist understands that any action in space has a ripple effect. It's not always predictable, and you can't control it because action is not about controlling. But, you know, so the fact that they were like, we are going to claim this space in a park in the middle of downtown New York, and we don't know what's going to happen, you know, it's kind of amazing. And if you look at the history of that movement, a few months before, there were other performance artists doing things related to inequality in Wall Street in lower Manhattan. So here's like, it's a kind of almost a cumulative effect, you know, and as you could probably guess, Occupy certainly had a big impact in our culture. 
Um, I'll add to that just starting with the gallery because I think you gave a great example and it just jogged my memory and I want to speak about one more gallery and that's PPOW. Right. And they really have been a pioneer in showing political art. And one thing that really, and they show a lot of women artists and they're one of the few galleries that has more of a 50-50 roster in terms <coughs> of the amount of women and amount of men that they show. And they have made a strong commitment to some women artists and performance artists including Carolee Schneeman and Martha Wilson and made a commitment to them when their work was not selling at all. This was not about money for them at that time, and even to this day. And they have pushed and pushed and pushed and tried to place their work in museums. It's incredibly slow. It's shocking to know that, I mean, it took forever for Carol Lee Schneeman to have some, a major show in a museum. And It was only last year she had her first retrospective. Yeah, and, and you know, as art students, we've known about her since the early, you know, late 70s and before. She was a model for so many women <laughs> artists. At any rate, that's an example of what a cultural institution that is a for-profit um, entity, they can really make a big difference. But I also think that it's artists uh, changing neighborhoods. It's classic. So, like, uh, Fanny Lerman and Graham White are in, in Detroit. They're in, they gave an essay to this book, and they took over a building and then they took over another building and then they got their friends to come in and they took over a whole section of Detroit. And I think that that's really important because that happens often in different communities. They'll change, change over a community, uh, I think, perhaps for the better, and in injecting that culture. I think also in education, like you do. So Julia has been teaching at a private school for, is it an all-boys school? It is. I mean, that's it's amazing. To it, but, um. Right, a chair of an all-boys school. I mean, I think it's pretty amazing that you do that. How many years have you been there? Uh, a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that's, that's really important. And I think also artists who actually do things out of the box, like create residencies for other artists, um, that, that can also include the public to be interact to interact with artists um, out in the public realm. I think that happens a lot. Now, the NEA though made a big push in the last five years for placemaking, which is controversial. I think sometimes it worked, but more often it didn't. But because it was, I think the NEA concentrated so much on the economics rather than the well-being for others. Um, however, I think the intentions were good in that it was trying to insert artist in community, but I think that happens naturally, actually. But it has to be encouraged, and I actually think it should be funded. Yeah, I don't know if you agree with that, though. Well, I just think the only drawback in terms of artists in community, of course, is the instrumentalization of artists as part of gentrification, right. which unfortunately has become a whole different issue, where the arts community now is sort of in this position where you have neighborhoods like Boyle Heights in Los Angeles or even the Bronx in New York who are saying like we actually don't want arts inst organizations because we know what's coming next and you're a Trojan horse for this thing that's coming right after you right. or with you you know it could be either so and that's 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 actually a danger that we're still having to negotiate. <coughs> yeah but would you say though in Detroit though it's I think it's needed now or has been I mean the, the artists there are creating a backbone for that city, I mean. I don't know Detroit well enough to comment on but, but the way it sort of works there, so. Could it be that there's a point where that can be stopped, that gentrification, I don't know. If, if we figure that out, I think we can all. <laughs> I, think, I think the problem is we haven't figured out if gentrification, what, what it is, because it is, a, it is a system, you know, it's not, and it's not really a system the art community has any control over, to be quite honest, you know, or at least partly. You know, um, so, and that's part of the problem. Like, I don't know. I mean, what uh, Detroit is such a specific example that has the potential, but then, you know, in 20 years, are we going to look back and go, why didn't we do something? You know, I don't know. <laughs> it's a really interesting question. I, I wonder, while we're on this, how, what are more successful ways of funding art or making mm -hmm. making sustainable livelihoods? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we, have, we I'm curious about the NAA, NEA National Endowment for Humanities. There, there are sort of government projects, and and other countries are much better at doing this too. I was at a talk last night where it was pointed out that the uh, 
the budget for art in Berlin is greater than the entire NEA budget, apparently, something like that. I, I don't know if that's true, but... <laughs> well, I think New York City's budget is bigger, too. Yeah, well, so, so there's, there's a lot of disjointedness in, in the, with the way these policies work, but then uh, there are other ways as well, and, and one of the things I'd be curious to hear a little bit about is, is that when I think about the art I read about in the newspaper, it's the billionaires using it for holding on to their capital and moving it around um, in ways that, you know, maybe it's hard to move around your Central Park apartment, but you can move around your Andy Warhol uh, in, in a container somewhere. And, and, and I'm wondering how it feels, I mean, you're in New York and in the middle, you know, part, you've seen that scene too. So I, I'm curious, what are some of the different sides of this as you see it? Uh, Nick, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Say are you on? Can, can we it, hear? Hello? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, I would just wanted to make a comment about comparing Europe to the United States Please. before we leave that Great. Um, <laughs> ten, tangent. And that is that in Germany, and I can speak just about Germany right now because I did spend four months there and um, a while ago, but it struck me that there's a Kunstverein or Kunsthall in every little tiny town. They're a little museum that does not have necessarily a permanent collection, but they're constantly showing contemporary art. Mm -hmm. Artists there seem to be able to survive. Mm. In, they're not well known, they're not famous, but it is tradition and a cultural tradition for you know, a family, when they get married, to invest some money into at least one decent work of art. Mm. And it, not necessarily by a famous artist. I think that we're talking about the difference between an access to education, not just art education, but access in the public schools and throughout the culture that students there have to education and to museums which are affordable or mainly free. Um, we don't have that kind of foundation here. If a child here maybe you know inherits a lot of money or somebody has money, they probably would not think about buying art as one of the first purchases that they want to make. They might want to buy something more materialistic. Or, but I think they're, you know, if we can somehow bridge that gap, um, and there are small efforts to do so with the affordable art fair and with you know many ways that maybe you can speak to that of artists run spaces, but it's a, it's, it is a real problem, I think. I mean, as to value, though, like in this country, the, there's not that kind of value. That's what has to change, because it's not in education. It's not in, in I'm certainly in younger education, I, I, except that it, it's so fascinating that parents just fawn over their kids as genius when they do something amazingly creative, and then somehow that genius is not accepted when they're adults. I mean, there's some disconnect there. So I think that that value and that tradition is long, right? That's what has to change here. I mean, that is really the roots of the problem. I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> well, I mean, I, th I think um, what people perceive to be the engine of the art world, this sort of like high item, high, high priced art, it's like, that, I mean, that's not really part of my world. Do you know? It's like, and I think it's much smaller than people like to think it is, because I mean, it's sort of sexy, you know? It's like a million dollar artwork, people, you know, hoarding art in containers in Switzerland, which does happen, um, you know, because there's the whole free trade zones and all these types of things where people don't have to pay taxes and they have artworks stored in free ports and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, that's, that's not really interesting to me as a writer and and you know so I, I try not to discuss that too much you know because I feel like you're just feeding this PR mill you know and the reality is that the art world is so saturated with art PR people who are paid a lot of money you know I mean I heard of one gallery paying one PR firm half a million dollars a year what and this gallery is not that it's actually more common than you think um, but you know like these these sort of places that are paying what are they paying for? They're paying for reviews at specific venues. They're paying for some sort of placement in fairs. They're paying for all these types of things, you know? And, and of course, so people want to create conversations around them. If you have people sitting there behind a computer trying to think of ways to pitch you to a publication, and they want it to be sexy because they want to attract collectors and all these types of things, you know, they're, they're going to create that perception. Do I think that perception is real? No. I think that's only one part and it's actually not even the most interesting part of our community. And I think the keys of sustainability, to get back to your question, is that artists have ways of living in the cracks, so meaning that they, they can uh, come up, just like they do in their studios, like come up with something from nothing. 
They, uh, I think artists uh, are pros at uh, bouncing back from failure like no other field. Um, that's actually been written about a lot, and I believe that's very true. But also artists are aware, I think most artists, hopefully they're responsible, <laughs> that can be aware that uh, they keep their expenses low, and that's a big part of that sustainability. Most artists I know who sustain a creative life do that very well. But then they're also persistent, they can resist failure or go through it, um, and create opportunities for themselves. I think that's also the key, is that when artists can create opportunities for themselves and then engage public in projects, then they're able to um, benefit from that financially and uh, growth in their work and also community, like community building. I think that's essential. Yes. Very general, but, um, but that's the common thread through all the artists that I know that sustain. And I should say that I think only I don't know if you would agree with this, but I think it's 0.001% of artists really make their living directly from a gallery. There's no such thing anymore. There's no such thing either as, quote, representation. That's an old word. That's an old artist who died. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no. I know there was something that it's I true. Want to add. I want to add something to that, and that is that um, there's so many stereotypes of artists. You yes. Know, the artist who can't even string a sentence together. The artist who doesn't know how to get dressed. The artist who, you know, doesn't know how to behave in public. And who also is dumb, because the only thing they can do is to draw. They don't know how to write. And this is so wrong, because most artists I know wear many, many hats in order to survive. And, you know, I think that that's one thing that this book really, that's a myth that this book debunks right, trying incredibly to do well. Thanks. And that's how all these artists survive. You know, they're, they're writers, they're, um, you know, teachers, professors, carpenters, no, they have their own businesses. They <laughs> also think they're in the corporate sector. I mean, Brett Wallace in this book, he's in the corporate sector. He was hired by LinkedIn because he's an artist. And he manages about 50 people in a group to come up with creative solutions, problem solving. But you're probably tired of me saying this too, but uh, I should say this, but in the last tour, I, I would meet the public who, who were surprised that actually I took a shower, or I didn't have paint in my hair, or I wasn't lazy. It's ridiculous. So we, we all took showers, I think. You know, we're wearing clean clothes. <laughs> we don't have paint in our hair. We're real, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting. and and. And I agree that the, the sort of the, the super rich, it, it, it's not all of the art world. And, and I, I was spending some time studying music through the years and, of course, big transition in music from the old business model, the recording companies and the records and selling the monetizing the recorded object, is going away. Uh, and, and it's not coming back in a, in a big way, I think. Um, but, and, and among my musician friends, there's a lot of anger and upset and, and confusion about we used to be able to make money this way and now we can't. Mm -hmm. It seems unfair. But, but one of the things I always like to point out is that the other thing that's happened in the same period of time is that wage gains have gone almost exclusively to the 1%. Uh, and everybody else has stayed flat. And the minimum wage has stayed flat and had uh, the middle class gained product, the, the gains from productivity had gone to the middle class and, and the working class and the poor people in the same way it's gone to the, the 1% and really the 0.1%. You'd have more money floating around to buy art at your wedding and, and, and to buy music and to spend money on music, whether it's a live show or, or, or buy a sculpture or, or buy something. So I, I, I do think that you know, when we think about the, the system of sustainability, it's much bigger than just artists. And, and it's yeah. much bigger than and even art production houses and galleries. But it's, it's this broader, uh, basically robbing of the middle class that started from, or robbing of all the classes except the super rich uh, since the 1980s. Um, and it's not unique to America, but we're one of the forerunners uh, and innovators in that space. Uh, but Japan and Europe, I mean, you see it in other places as well. So I, I always like to bring that in. I think there would be more sustainability were there uh, more equitable sharing mm -hmm. of the fruits of our, what is a slow growing, but nevertheless growing economy. And so I always like to put that in there. 
Yeah, I mean, one of the things, I, I, you know, a lot of people may not know, like, but the art market is, is and I'm going to talk about the market aspect, not the whole art world, um, is like one of the last unregulated industries, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And part of the reason is because it's actually not that as big as people think it is sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not Hollywood, we're not the music industry, and the truth is it's probably only, you know, it's probably ballooned in the last 10, 15 years to the point where... I, I suspect eventually we'll get some regulation. You know, when the, the numbers get too big, someone's going to want to walk in and put a tax on it or something. But, um, but, it, but, you know, like I was saying earlier, it was like, we're a microcosm. You know, we see that. We see the inequality. And, you know, and one of the worst tendencies of that is, you know, art is now being used as a fig leaf, not just for developers, but also from a lot of countries that have a lot of really awful human rights and other mm -hmm. issues that use art and the perception of it to create <laughs> this perception that it's more egalitarian, that they're more open to dialogue. You know, a perfect example is everything from Qatar to like U UAE to like Russia to like a lot of these places that we probably you know, that is considered autocratic states, but then they sort of fund this very elite culture. And I mean, I remember when I was in the UAE and I was like, this is great. So do kids come in? And I was like, they were like, what? And, and I was like, so are, is there art taught in public schools? And this was only three years ago. And they were like, no, there's no art taught in public schools. Because, you know, and, and you're just like, okay, this is not a real thing. You know, this is, you know, when you're, when you're at that level, then you're like, this is a really, this is a, a pyramid scheme of sorts or something. I don't know. A cultural pyramid? Does that exist? A cultural pyramid scheme. It could be, yeah. Exactly. yeah. It, it makes sense. Maybe we heard it here first. But, uh, uh, quite plausible. Uh, let's talk about some of the varieties of politics. And, and Julia, you were talking about vi visibility. <laughs> Uh, as, yeah. as an important aspect. I mean, Sharon, I think what you're doing with this book and, and, and humanizing and, and really showing the diversity uh, of artists and how they get by and what they do. And, and Ryan, you know, this, this website, you know, this blogazine, it's more than just a website, but the, the, how you think about, well, what is the visibility one can make and, and, and what kind of audiences do you reach? I mean, I guess that's, that's what I'm thinking because there's something about change and community that's complex, actually. I mean, how do we get beyond the cliche a little bit? Like, just put it out there. And you know that they'll come. And, you know, and I, I think we now know, partly thanks to the internet, if you build it, they don't come. Uh, but if you build an audience, it's a different story. You know, and all of a sudden now things are enabled. And so I'm very interested in that. It, it, not only just building an audience or maybe putting like some of the visibility stuff I think about, you know, ACT UP and, yes. and, and some of the ways that this was not a visibility that people wanted to see uh, and it was upsetting and die-ins and, and it was a very powerful thing to bring that in front of people. Uh, and, and so anyway, I'm curious, uh, I'm sure you've had, all had a lot of experiences, so if there's something in that space. I don't know, I could just briefly say that ACT UP was really a phenomenal model for other uses of agit problem politics. Um, you know, there are others who preceded them. And some of the students might not be so aware of ACT UP, but maybe tell, tell us a little bit more about No? Yeah. Yes, I couldn't tell you what year it was founded because, but um, the we have with AIDS the crisis, <laughs> <laughs> the AIDS crisis really began in the 80s, and I would say the mid 80s, and um, I can tell you when ACT UP started, but the it was mostly a gay male group that began, and then it was supported by lesbians who were really interested in, you know, as you said, civil disobedience, in a sense. And they showed up and, you know, did dimes in front of the state houses, chained themselves to congressional, you know, offices, and made themselves highly, highly visible, and made forced legislators to pay attention to their demands. I mean, this was a time when Ronald Reagan was in the office and in office, and funding was not going to research for AIDS, and people were dying, and and there was so much prejudice as a result. Um, I don't want to go on and on about that, mm -hmm. but ACT UP really made a big impact <coughs> in changing legislation <coughs> and drawing the entire public's attention to the crisis. Um, then the Women's Action Coalition, which is a group that I was in formed in the early 90s and really um, was started because of a combination of events that took place. One was the Clarence Thomas hearings, 
Um, and Anita Hill's testimony about his um, predatory behavior. And the other was uh, rape trials at St. John's University, and that was taking place near New York City. And as a result, this group started and gathered at the Drawing Center in New York City, and really heavy hitters became part of that core group. Um, many well-known artists like Laurie Anderson and Cindy Sherman and on and on, and many of these were white women, but they had a lot of impact on the art community. And we engaged in active prop, and we created committees on different issues. I happened to be on the issue uh, lesbian statistics uh, committee. And so we published a book about the discrimination that was going on, and all the laws that differed from state to state, from sodomy laws and so on. Um, and now, we're in an era where we all need to be activists. And, um, if anything positive has come out of this horrible time, that's it. I'm a founding member of the group called We Make America, and we started as a group of 16 artists and some journalists. And we thought, what do we have to contribute right now? The one thing we have to contribute is visual imagery and strong visual imagery. We wanted to make an impact in the Women's March. That was our single focus. We came up with a symbol which has some problems, but I think at this point it's very relevant. We decided to use the Statue of Liberty as our symbol, um, with the torch being the predominant one. And the issue of immigration was really the top, top on our list, and discrimination against refugees. So we made a huge visual impact in both the New York March and the DC March, and we're going to continue. Um, we're just in the process of figuring out where we want to go. We're working with a sanctuary group in New York. Um, we're also doing fundraisers for politicians who are running for office, such as John Alsop, who's running for Congress in Georgia. We did a fundraiser for him. And, you know, we know that our strength is in the fact that we're visual artists. We can't solve every problem. There's so many groups that are out there right now with knowledge bases, ACLU, Southern Poverty Law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, working families party, but we can show up at other people's rally and we can support other rallies. We can go to a Black Lives Matter rally. We need to go there. We can't expect other groups to come to us. We're trying to educate ourselves about the issues. I could go on and on, but I think that's... I don't know where to start. I know, yeah, that's so that much is so huge. Um, you know, it, what we try to do is we try to respect our audience and not talk down to them, which I think unfortunately is not, is not that common in, in the cultural fields, or fields that consider themselves elite cultural fields, or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, and, and like I'll tell you, two years ago, white nationalists started showing up on our commenting. So like this whole wave doesn't surprise me of this whole talk we were talking about. They were in the comments. It, like anybody who's been paying attention on Reddit or whatever, like they're there. They've been there for a while, and they've been, you know, and so somewhat times it gives a, allows us to be the barometer of like looking and just listening. And, and you know, I think listening is so important to what we do. So listening to what people are actually talking about and where the concerns are, where the anxieties are. And then you start figuring out, you go, wait a minute, there's an issue here. You know, like when we were doing one of the things, one of the first issues that we were working with or were, or were thinking about was internships. Like why are there so many unpaid internships? You know, and we realized that that was feeding a system. You know, and now my, one of the issues I, I'm really concerned about is curators. You know, like in terms of curators are really underpaid. You know, and and that's going to have a huge impact on who becomes a curator. You know, and curators are sort of the hidden gatekeepers. You know, in in this community, and so you're like, okay, well, if they're if we're not attracting a diverse range of curators, we're not going to be able to respond to society. And and I personally do think that that is one of the problems with like people's perceptions of arts funding. I think they feel like it's certain only one type of politics. It's one type of you know, community, it's all these types of things that I think end up filling people's perceptions of what we are as a community. And I think that's kind of dangerous, so. I think moving forward though, what's really important is, uh, like we're here at MIT List, which it ha by having us talk about this in this climate, it becomes a safe space for all of us to be able to share and exchange and uh, hopefully have outcome from this, from ideas uh, uh, spoken about here. But I would love to see that all the museums 
uh, in all over the country be sanctuary museums, as yeah. we were talking about. And I think that that is really important. I think. What well, is a sanctuary? Can museum. you talk about it? Yeah. So this is a growing movement where we're trying to get. Um, art spaces to sign on to the sanctuary movement and there are four levels of sanctuary um, in terms of first level just being basic uh, not revealing the immigration status of your employees do you know which which it doesn't I mean sounds like it's pretty basic but the reality is that most employees and visitors are not guaranteed that so for instance I know one museum 10% of their employees are DACA you know, which is, if the, those you may not know, is dreamers. They call them dreamers in the media. So usually children that came when they were very young and their parents are undocumented and they never got immigration papers. But this is sort of a reality that communities are facing. And then the second level is information hub for people to get information. Third is short-term sanctuary, like in the case of raids, like ICE raids or something like that. And then the fourth level would be long-term sanctuary, which right now only religious institutions have been doing. I want to make sure. So, Sharon, you should think of a question you want to ask <laughs> as our co as my co moderator. <laughs> uh, and I, but I'd also like to encourage everyone in the audience to think of your questions now. There, we have a microphone over here. Uh, so uh, please, if you have something you'd like to ask or discuss, uh, please join the conversation. I don't know. I mean, I think we went over a lot of it. I I, I would just want to talk about, I mean, I'm always interested in the role of artists today. I mean, that's really, really important to me. And I think that um, it's very important to give artists um, some relevance. I mean, well, they have relevance, but to, to recognize it. I guess I would just talk about, um, for all of you and Ian, um, you know, what, what do you think it means for an artist today to produce culture actively and have that integrated in society? It's such a general question. But I'm wondering if you have any examples, or maybe we talked about it as far as sustainable models, but I'm actually not talking about that. I guess getting out of the bubble of the art world and what we see that are effective ways in which artists actually uh, is, are recognized in society. I mean, what's interesting is that musicians, theater, people in theater, performing arts are always recognized, but it's people who are, who are singular, like poets and artists who, were not as recognized. And in fact, actually in Australia, part of the cuts to funding, the 70% cuts to funding, were really only for um, all the arts except for the performing arts. That was it. And big performing arts, like opera, big dance companies, but all of the 99% and the experimental artists were completely cut out. And there's no philanthropy in Australia, so they're left high and dry. So I just wonder, I also the value of that in this country is so important, it's just not recognized. Anyway, I'm meandering on any, any thoughts about these things. Uh, I do want to say the one sort of elephant in the room when it comes to that issue for me is the fact that you know, it's really hard work to engage with an audience and a public, like honestly, mm -hmm. and at their level. And I think a lot of people avoid it, to be quite honest. Well, I, think that, I think a lot of people <laughs> don't kind of avoid those conversations because they're kind of messy and they're not comfortable. And, and you know, and I think curate, a good curator can be that mediator yeah. often, um, but unfortunately a lot of them aren't doing that role because, they, because they're too worried about figuring out about their funders and their board and all these types of things. They're not doing the nitty gritty work. So that's my one thing that I just sort of want to throw out there. Which I think leaves the work to art educators in a sense. And, um, and I feel that, you know, First of all, institutions need to offer that art education and accessibility to public school kids. I happen to now currently teach in a private school, but I did teach for a studio in a school, which was a great organization that sends artists into the public schools. On the other hand, you still have to have funding for that, and there was a, so much inequality in terms of which public schools would get an art teacher. And I want to add even something else to that, which is outrageous, which is in many communities, parents get together and do fundraisers so that they can you know, raise funds for the, pay the salary for the art teacher. Wow. And, and communities that can't raise the salary for the art teacher don't have one. And that happens everywhere. That happens even in New York City. So it's really up to us, though, as art educators to be knowledgeable of what's out there. I do my little part, you know, in the school where I'm teaching and teach a course called Facing History and Ourselves, where students have to make uh, social and political works of art. These are ninth graders. 
And we take them out to see shows that are primarily political shows. And we do explain to them that art makes a difference and can make a difference, and it does in their lives. Because if I take a group of kids to the African burial ground and they're predominantly African American and they're looking at artwork by um, African American artists and artists of color in that memorial, it, you know, it's tremendous. And they're learning about the history of slavery in New York City. And I take those kids to Carrie James Marshall's show and it, you know, it's unbelievable. They might not have been able to go to a museum even otherwise. So I'm railing on and on, but I really, really would like more funding to go to arts education. And I think it's the one thing that can link um, the public to the artist. I'm totally, I'm totally with you on that, because I feel like it's not just creating artists, it's creating audiences. Do you know, and I think we right. don't think about how you create an audience, do you know? And, and that's not part of the equation right now. But also corporations are, are, I think we were talking about this the other day, that they're, they're uh, embracing creativity to be profitable. profitable. Yes. And so I think that uh, they want to also see creativity to be more emphasized in education. But see, I think the public, it's the value. And also I think artists, visual artists, have to get into the public more, maybe outside of our bubbles, but then the public also has to come forward. And I think museums and cultural institutions are gonna be instrumental in going forward to try to create those, like they always have been, but I think even more so, even more, more, more so than ever, because I do think even though the NEA and the NEH, I believe they're gonna be flattened, that's high, it's just highly symbolic, essentially. Even though the, it's not much of a funding stream, but it will actually affect some small arts organizations across the country where I know their budgets are gonna be, uh, are gonna be hurt very, very much. However, I think it's, 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 it's lacking here. So it's very interesting, and one of the things that struck me, so I've lived in Japan now for about five years, and I, I spent a year teaching at a junior high school. And I remember it was shortly after I arrived there, and uh, the, whole, the whole school was up in arms. There was a, a big activities going on. I said, like, what's going on? I said, well, we're preparing for our, our singing competition. I said, oh, that's interesting. What, what's the singing competition? He said, well, every class in the school forms a four-part harmony chorus. Uh, I said, well, wait, you mean the chorus? They get the chorus? And I was like, no, everyone in the school, each classroom, which is together all day, they all make a chorus, and they have to sing some complicated Bach piece or something, and you're like, wow, and, and the music teacher does the accompaniment. No, actually, <laughs> one of the students will do the accompaniment on the piano for the entire class. And you say, well, how is that? I mean, I, I went to junior high school, I was in chorus, I, was an, I couldn't sing at all, but it was fine, I was welcomed. And, and yet the idea that somehow everyone in school would be expected to sing in harmony and that there'd be someone in the class in the seventh grade who was good enough to play the piano along. But, I mean, it just was such a different expectation of, of how, of, of course, you, you just you know, learn. It's not going to be great. It's okay if it was actually very high, high level. And then, so as I go on and I'm studying musicians in Japan, and, and you say, well, why is there such an appreciation for music in all these levels? Part of it is that you, you don't have that experience that, oh, that's, that's something that somebody else does. I've been told I can't sing, so I don't sing. I've been told I can't paint, so I don't paint. I've been told I can't do pottery, so I don't do pottery. That's just for the, the arty people. I'm not an arty person. Whereas if you have the entire school doing it, everybody has a little taste of it, uh, and it's not so terrifying. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that to me, like, that's a very interesting way to connect this. How do you, how do you build an audience, and, and how is education so integral to that? And, and again, sort of how, how do we learn our own distance from art is one of the things that always strikes me. That's, it, and that's why I like this sort of theme of art as cultural producer. I didn't quite get the idea at first, but now I see part of what it means is how your artwork needs to get out into society, and it's part of culture, and it's part of the air you breathe, it's not something that's just inside the gallery. Exactly. I mean, I can't talk about every cultural community, but one with the visual art community, I do think that opaqueness and that distance 
is actually cultivated by some people. Yeah, well, um, yeah. I think specifically, I, I think it's actually a tool of victimizing the artist sometimes. Mm -hmm. Meaning like, when you do, oh, you don't talk about money, it's just about the art. And it's like, no, actually, I gotta pay my bills. Like, you can't, you know, and it's like, in, the, in some communities, it's like, if you bring up money, somehow you're a heathen. And you're like, no, actually, this is, what we do, you know? And so I do think that 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 clearly benefits certain demographics and certain groups. And I think it's a, we, we have to fight against it. I mean, that's just the reality. Like I, I, you know, I always say like, you can talk to me about money, great. I can't always do what you need me to do, but like, you know, I will tell you. So I always make a point, even if I say, no, it's all right, I'll do it for free. I always try to make a point of say, okay, how much are you gonna pay me to do this? Do you know, because I just want that to be a normal thing people bring up in a regular conversation. That's what I did with this tour, specifically like um, talking to many venues there are two pe two venues that said no out of 95. That's pretty good, but I'm I'm still uh, upset about the two. And one of the two, I can't get over the two. And then one of the two said, no, we don't really pay artists. I'm like, really? Why? And they said, because our, we haven't had to. Right. So the problem is that artists are not asking for it. And then the value is from that institution, they don't feel like they have to pay them. And they think that exposure is is uh, is an exchange. It's, it's not. So I think it just has to change. There's all these these things that have to change uh, as far as value on all yes. fronts. And and I, I want to bring up a statistic about that wage, which is this really oh, yeah. great group that right. that's been trying to get artists paid and other people paid in the cultural industry. They did a study, and the thing is that's counterintuitive that you may not realize. But what they discovered was the wealthier a nonprofit was, the less artist fees they paid. Mm. Wow. It's not the it's opposite. True, actually. So a small arts nonprofit may pay an artist five hundred bucks or a thousand, whatever. But MoMA will never pay an artist. That. Do you know? And so it's counterintuitive. Right. As some place gets wealthier, you think, oh, they're going to pay more. No, that's not the way it works because they actually feel more entitled right. and they feel like they're doing you a favor. You know what's great about a case study? You can out people. <laughs> I'm going to do that. I'm going to out all these institutions. It's so great as an artist at 52 that I can actually do that. That's awesome. But that's also part of the problem is the art world isn't transparent, which is a whole other conversation, and it should be. Speaking of transparent, let's have some questions for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, Paul, are you working out with the mic? Oh right, my you try that. I get paid to do this. All right, all right. <laughs> exactly. And please do me a favor and introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi uh, guys, okay, this is uh, uh, great. Thanks. I'm, I'm Murray Robinson. I'm a, a, a biologist. Um, and so we're talking about politics. We're talking about obviously uh, politics and funding are directly related, and this is a challenge today. Um, it's my somewhat naive perception that the visual contemporary art skews very left. Um, and so I see maybe an intrinsic challenge there with, with connecting that to funding. So you talk about bridges, Ian, you, you showed the Sydney Bridge picture. Um, uh, you know, in music, we've got, you know, Ted Nugent and Kid Rock and maybe Kanye, I'm not sure, um, <laughs> on one side of, of the spectrum. Um, what is your experience in either identifying or experiencing or cultivating contemporary visual artists on the other side of the aisle? I mean, they, they're around. I mean, I don't think they're, I mean, you know, in my own community, I know a number of Republicans that are artists. Um, but, uh, or, you know, I could name one. Oh, actually, I told you so. But anyway, I'm not going to, that's their business. <laughs> they're, they're I blocked it out. Their their business. It's totally yes, fine. Yes, okay. But at the same time, it's like, but I think, it depends on the type of art they're doing. Like, I think the gallery system and the way we're sort of engaged in individual experience, I do believe that it's certain, it's kind of like actors. It's like, it's, it's a huge amount of empathy that's sort of placed on the individual in a certain kind of place. I, I just wonder whether like somebody's gonna study and say like that kind of activity goes a certain way. The same way that we say accountants go a certain way. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. Is that possible? Yes. But like, but then I think in terms of Artists, I think I've seen it more in places like gamers, people who design video games. Some of them has sometimes have a little more right of center politics or far right or whatever, um, as we're discovering with like the alt right and all these types of groups. Um, so it depends on the type of production they're doing. That's what I do. That's what I'm seeing. 
Um, but then the other thing is, you know, I think uh, maybe it's also a result of the places where art is being made. You know, if you're growing up in New York, if you're living in New York, you know, you're probably going to be around a different kind of community, you know. Um, so I wonder if that's going to happen, if that has an influence. But there's a lot of collectors who are Republican. Oh, yes, sure. that's yeah. very true. Which is problematic. Um, the ICA Miami, one of their main collectors is the person who uh, funds Marco Rubio, for instance. Oh, Do you know, nice. and that's, but that's not even the only thing. I mean, uh, there's also one of the, you know, the head of Black Rock, I mean, um, Black Rock, um, which I guess, I don't, I'm not even sure what his politics are anymore, but he's what Trump advisor, and he's on the board of the MoMA. Yeah, right. There's a number of board members that are, you know, very right wing. Um, the Coke Plaza yeah. at the Metropolitan Museum, um, you know, they gave, he, he gave, David Koch gave $65 million to refurbish the plaza, and then also at the Lincoln Center. So, I mean, they're there. They're just maybe not in the artist's cadre right now, yeah. or at least openly. Because then there was also that Seattle artist. Now that I kind of think of it, there are a lot more. <laughs> that Seattle artist that people discovered was a white supremacist, and he's been like oh, Charles Kraft. Charles Kraft. Oh yeah. my God! Yeah. I served on a panel with him. Yeah. No one he's knew. He's a freak. No yeah, one knew sorry. until a critic actually did the investigation, because oh he would actually integrate swastikas in his ceramic oh work, and he was a well-known artist. Uh, yeah. And he would do this, and people thought it was an ironic gesture. Yeah. And then someone actually did the research, and they found out he was a white nationalist. Wow. Do you know, and oh we're just like, God, you're like, awesome. how did no one figure that out? Maybe they could make a funding, like, so, you know, subcategory for those guys. And then, the, and, uh, <laughs> I mean, when did that come out? How did I miss about that? About two one? years ago, I think. Oh my gosh. You didn't know so, that? No, because and I served on a panel with him, and now I, and now I remember See, that. So, so people's politics aren't always so obvious, even no. if they openly say that. No. Um, and I do want to say one thing. When we did, we did, we did, during the inauguration day, some of us helped organize what we called an art strike, which was a national sort of shut down art spaces. And it was so interesting to me that nonprofits were the ones that were least likely to close. It was the commercial galleries that were the most likely to close for an art strike. And it's amazing to me because that's totally not what we expected. Yeah, why? Why do you think that was? Because I think, I think, the, I think the reality is most uh, small businesses, it's so much easier to make decisions. And I think in these nonprofits, there are right-wing voices embedded like it, on board members or stuff that would just be like, no. So I know, for instance, one museum, all the staff and curators and leadership wanted to close, but they knew the, the board was kind of not being clear if they wanted to close. Do you know, and that's an example. So we're starting just to see what the politics of the art world are. Because I think we had this assumption, and I don't think it's necessarily true either. Yeah, and when I, I'm not sure that I can answer the whole question, but one of the things that comes up as, as a educator and a, a professor in New England area, there's a recent study saying that liberals are destroying colleges because it, it sort of doesn't allow for enough openness of dialogue. I like to think that's not entirely true. I, I don't think that's a great representation of what happens in the classroom, in my experience. Uh, but exactly this, that it, maybe the, the, there's been studies saying, oh, there's, it's 28 to 1 liberals versus conservatives. I'm a little skeptical of those numbers, uh, partly because a lot of us who are in the classroom have to, that's the point, is to try to deal with a variety of, of opinions and, and make space for it. And, and we're maybe not always successful, but I think sometimes at least the effort is there. And, and yet, again, the boards uh, of the major institutions, I, I would be curious what the numbers come out there. But I, uh, that's what I said. I'd be happy to trade my position here for a couple semesters with David Koch, you know, on the board of MIT of trustees, and 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 let's well, you, you try, you can have the classroom, and, and I'll I'll make some decisions for the, the corporation. Uh, so far, no. Uh, Keep trying. Right, but I, I don't. If if that's really the issue, <laughs> we could we could try that and see how it goes. Uh, but so that's that's why I wonder. I mean, they're they're the same with the banks, you know, and and, and some of the financial BlackRock comes up, and, and Fidelity, you know, the head of Fidelity is part of the MIT board as well. And, and not that I think they're they're doing an entirely bad job, and they're very generous, and they help out, and and it's just but, that. But they also make money off of all. Of they also make money off it, right? And actually, and, 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 and MIT is actually being sued. Uh, for, for that okay. collusion with Fidelity. Um, I, it, it's under investigation. It hasn't been decided yet as far as I know. 
Uh, but but I just I think it's important. What I what I'm always frustrated with is with this conversation sometimes is that uh, like in the classroom we're we're really trying to do that. Whereas I don't feel that way sometimes with the boards of, of great financial institutions if they're really saying, okay, let's reach out uh, to the working people, let's reach out to the liberal faculty members and, and figure out what they, what they what's, let's have a dialogue with them and let's see where they're coming from. So, so anyway, that's, that's a, one side of it that I, I experience a little bit as well. Please. Good evening. My name is Louisa McCall and I um, co-founded and co-directed a project called Artists in Context and produced something called the Artist Perspectives for the Nation. And I wanted to go back to the issue of uh, value and valuing artists and artistic inquiry in our society. Um, it's been sort of a lifelong concern of mine in my work. And I've watched um, artists sort of be imbued with value as creative economy producers, um, as, and now as creative placemakers, as you suggested. And where I've kind of landed, I guess, at this stage is raising um, the level of art and artistic inquiry to the level of knowledge production, not cultural production, but actual knowledge production, and positioning artists as researchers. Um, you know, just doing basic research that is equally valuable, although different from, you know, scientific research. Um, and I'm just wondering what you think about that positioning. I mean, I think it's really valuable. Like, for instance, one thing, like, give you an example, I think, like, research. I, I, I like that framing, but I don't think it does capture all artistic right. production. Right. That's one of the problems with that. Is one of the things, uh, the Columbia Architecture Graduate Program, for instance, they did that smell project at the Morgan Library about smelling <laughs> books. You know, and I mean, what a crazy, wonderful idea, but you know, I bet you eventually that will become something else, you know, but it's going to take an architect or a designer or an artist to think that up, do you know, and say, we're going to smell books and see what's going on. And everyone else is like, okay, we can't make money off that. But, but, you know, that could be technology that then goes on, triggers another idea. And I think that's a great idea. The problem is we're going to fall into the quantifiable yes, true. bucket. You know, and I, everything needs to be quantifiable. And you're like, okay, well, what does that mean for art? Does that mean how many shows you have? Does that mean how many people show up to a lecture? I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And that's something that we actually faced when we went to raise an endowment fund for the artist perspectives for the nation. Um, but I think that, um, you know, we are only talking about um, a specific part of the art world or art community. Um, but I feel like the only way for society at large to understand uh, the vital value that artists bring to life, you know, in terms of the core values, the, the ethics, all these different things, is to say that they're knowledge producers, that, that in combination with scientific inquiry, artistic inquiry, blended together, will produce meaning that is far deeper and far more holistic than what, what's happening now. Yeah, but that that's already, we're already doing that. Mm -hmm. So the, the point is, is that, that, sure, that framing as, quote, research, that language that the, that the public is going to understand, but that's what artists are do, already doing. Right. We're creating well-being now. You know, artists who are producing, you know, it, it, I, I think it's, it's a lot just for somebody to share their truth in a different form and then to, to share it with others in a community. I think the problem is though that the questioning of it is in this academic frame that you're giving is what do you do with the research? What's the outcome? I'm interested in the outcome. So how does that research transform into cultivating actually progress? And so research sometimes stays idle and does it static and doesn't go anywhere. Um, and actually, I think artists move forward constantly so they don't stay static, nor does the knowledge that they produce, we keep going and going and going. So it's sort of anti what you're talking about. Research, it, sometimes it's just project to project and it's towards some kind of goal. But the goal that you're talking about is knowledge producers for what? 
Well, for different issues. Like if you look at the artist Natalie Jeremjenko, who I'm sure you guys all know in New York, um, she's uh, experimenting with uh, relationships, human relationships to nature, and she's advocating mutualism as opposed to control, which makes sense. And she, she enters into little experimental spaces and produces new models that demonstrate this mutualistic relationship. So, you know, artists are producing things, but I agree with you. I mean, I think that, you know, what we're talking about wanting to value is just is basic artistic research yeah, into I, social issues. I think it's really interesting. And, and that there's such varieties of value out there, and, and to say it's money or even or I mean numbers and audience is, is quite, Quite interesting. I think it's not true, of course. There's all these levels of value. And I think actually as we go, it's a little more theoretical, but as we go from what was a manufacturing industrial economy where we sold commodities to an information knowledge culture economy where value unfolds over time, it's not at the moment of purchase, that this is exactly the kind of thing we can puzzle through. So I think it's a great idea. But let's get to another question. Now we can come back to this issue, but let's come back to another question. Hi, my name is Mark Tywis, and I'm an artist. and. I want to kind of bring it back to current day. I'm kind of struggling with um, what kind of work to do. Do I make a strong statement that's in protest? I believe that now is the time to protest and resist. But also, I want to make work that brings people together around dialogue. Um, can you guys talk about that kind of art that becomes um, didactic or art that uh, ask questions and brings people for a dialogue. Thanks. I guess I would say you have to think about where you feel there's an urgency or a necessity. You know, where is the greater necessity for yourself? Um, I don't think you should look to someone else's standard. And that is that if you're really committed to um, creating a community about an issue and maybe fundraising or going to a march or whatever that is, then I think that's just as valid as making your own artwork. It's just, you know, socially engaged artwork. Um, I don't think that, in another note, there's so much to say about this, I think your work can be political without um, being, hitting somebody over the head, without being ideological, without, you know. Uh, it can be subtle. It can demonstrate something that you're struggling with. Making that work in itself is political. I really will go to that extent. And it means that you really have to know yourself. But on the other side of it, not that we're doing a lot of navel gazing here, but it's also know your community. And I think one thing that's happened as a result of this election is that it has brought artists out of their studios together into community. I mean, we are going to make stuff for the march and cut out torches and stuff because we want to hang out and eat chili and talk to each other and you know, feel or that we're, you know, valued human beings and supporting each other and just to survive what we're going through. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. Sharon, you can... There's an artist named Steve Locke who I talked to today. I wonder if he's here. I don't know if he's here. Um, I was hoping he'd be here. Um, but he makes portraits. So it, it, I mean, let me back up a second. Somebody on Facebook had said to me, because I, I make work that's not political, although I agree with Julia, if you're making something, that's political, just in this act. But anyway, somebody said, I think you should change. <laughs> and actually, he's a friend of mine now. I mean, I went out to lunch with him because I was so upset about this. Because I said, he said, I think you should change and make political work. Change yourself to make political work. I was like, are you kidding me? I can go and be an activist. I can do my work and I can do that what is truthful to me. And I can then do other things like protests, like being community. So Steve Locke, who's an artist here who teaches at Mass Art, he does these gorgeous, beautiful portraits. But then he sends out tons of postcards, I think like every day, to the Trump administration protesting. So you can do things. I think you should be true to yourself. I think you should know who you are as an artist and speak your truth that defines you and what your visual vocabulary is, whether or not it's overtly, quote, political or not. So I think every artist has validity. And quite frankly, abstraction, which Rog has taught me too, and I've done a lot of a lot more research since we've had this conversation when I was in Tel Aviv, 
that abstraction in the 1930s was hugely political, and it, ha and it was in many different countries, including Israel in the 1960s. So it should never be discounted what artists can give, whatever it is, and it shouldn't be ruled by other people. It should be dictated by you and who you are and what your truth is. And I'll just add one thing to that, which is, which is you, one thing you can do maybe is to get out of other people's way. Like meaning like, I feel like one of the worst things artists do is when they start judging each other, going, oh, that's too yeah, political, that's, that's too happened. obvious. Right. And you know, sometimes just your contribution could be, you do your work, you're committed to it, you do the protesting or whatever you want to do, but then just don't get in other people's way who may be doing work that is not like your work. Do you know, and I feel like sometimes people put that work down because it, it makes them feel bad that they're not doing so. Anyway, it could be a lot of reasons, but that's also something that I think people can do. And just support them. Support someone else who's doing that kind of work that you think is resonating in a certain way. Yeah. I'll ask oh. a question. There's one over there. Oh. <laughs> oh. Or do you want to ask a question, Paul? I want your question. Okay, so it seems like one of the opposing sides are people who want things to be paid by the public and people who wants to privatize everything. And this being MIT, if you look at data, it says that people who want public to pay for things, there's more of them, right? The de Democratic side won the popular vote, right? But it seems a small number of group on the other side, like the Kochs, they put large amounts of funding to Congress people and senators and what they're trying to do is to pass policy and laws. And they create policy and laws that changes things to their direction. Since we have more people, I shouldn't say we, since the other opposing side has more people, how is it that they're not getting, how is it that they're not creating policy and law to their liking, to what they believe in? Why is it that that, that, that side is losing? Ooh. So, are you talking just in terms of artist funding, or are you talking voted against that? Right. Why aren't these people being pressured to vote for the people? What are we doing? I think there's an I think there's an information vacuum a little bit. I mean, I'll tell you, like my I was, I was saying, talking earlier, like I'm having a little bit of a fight with my in-laws now because they ended up voting for Trump. And, and you know, when we actually had a conversation with them, we realized they actually didn't have a lot of the information. And it was so amazing to me, the information they didn't have. And they made it into a personality contest. Like some reason they didn't like Hillary. I think it's because they actually didn't want a woman, believe it or not. But I meant like these like things that we, we, don't, we don't take into account. We think the issue is just going to win because it's a logically explained issue. I don't think we take into account so much, you know, it, and, and I wish we did. And I mean, in their case, they really were, there was some information they had no idea about. You're right, we, there were more numbers on the Democrat sides, but we also know that all those numbers were on the coasts. You know what I mean? Like as an example, they were California, they were New York, they were wherever. But, you know, those, like there are places where information doesn't penetrate. You know, I just have to look at the stats of hyperallergic and I know where our readership is. Like, yeah. it's not in North Dakota, do you know? You know, so it's, it's, so then the question is, how do we penetrate those information bubbles? Um, Some people can't relate to people in rural areas. There's, that's that disconnect. And um, my mother voted for Trump too. I haven't talked to her since the election. But she lives in Florida and her, all of her friends voted for Trump, so sort of like this herd mentality too. And, um, and she just said, you know, it's politics as usual. Don't worry about it, it's not gonna change your life. Yeah. That was her position. So uh, yeah, I think we have a long way to go. I don't know what the answers are. Democracy is it's an ongoing experiment and, and we haven't achieved it yet. <laughs> and, and, and our elections are, are only, can only be part of our democracy. But I think it is important to, for us to remember, uh, for those who are upset about the Republican takeover, that, uh, or the Republican success, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, that there are more people on our side, uh, on the other side. Um, and 
And so, it, you know, so the idea that so part of, part of it is, is not that the in some ways the ideas are out there, or like so, so the the more uh, progressive ideas are out there and are affecting a broader number of people overall. However, our current system right now, as the Senate is is the worst, but now with the gerrymandering, the House is terrible, and then. Or that house is also leading. You know, more people can vote Democratic, and still nobody. We can't get enough uh, people, the Democrats, in Congress. And now the Electoral College, which I didn't think was supposed to work this way. I, I thought it was mostly that at least the presidency was supposed to be a popular vote. Now we know that's not true. Um, but but it, it's a process. It, it's a process that we're still working out. It's not simple. Um, and 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 I also agree that, that there is this there's an information bubble that's really becoming more pronounced, the Facebook situation, the social media situation, things, things have taken a real turn for the weird and, and where people get their knowledge. And, and, and so that's, I think that's all involved. And then the, the last thing I'd say is that for me, part of the hopes of the future of democracy is, is finding new ways to connect up. Um, and, and that's why I thought Occupy, people said, oh, Occupy had no effect, you know, it just it, it disappeared, the Tea Party had all this effect. But I think Occupy had one really big effect, which is this notion of 99%. Mm -hmm. uh, and that it, it, it's like you're saying, I mean, the power to the 1%, and really it is the 0.1%, I mean, it's mm -hmm. a tiny fraction. And, and what I also want to say is it's not that they're bad people. I, I don't think the billionaires are bad people. Yeah. But the system that produces that kind of funneling of money upwards, that's the problem. And, and so hopefully this is starting to expose some of the dangers of not addressing the failures of democracy. I mean, it's, it's sad to say, but we have to fight for voting rights again. You know, we have to, we have to fight for all of these things. We have to vote. We have to fight for information getting out there. We have to fight for children being able to go to schools and learn things and, and grown-ups to be able to retool their own skills as well. So it, it's, a, it's a big problem. It's not just the elections. It's a, it's a bad time right now uh, for, for those on the non-red side. But, uh, you know, it also has become a wake-up call, uh, you know, and the, the, the protests are encouraging and, and, and trying, okay, well, what's the next level of democracy and how do we get there? Uh, I think there is possibility still. Can I add to that just briefly that in, in light of what you just said, I mean, historically, the pendulum tends to swing back. And I think that we're going to suffer before it happens, but I do think it's going to happen. And secondly, I want to say that all the demonstrations, I feel that they're proactive, not always just reactive. They do have an incredible impact, and artists really can be leaders in those protests. And we do have a really important place in society within, in, within that role. So I just thought I'd bring it back to that. I mean, you had said on Hyperlogic um, from the Women's March that I, I think you had said that you had, couldn't believe how many signs there were. Well, handmade signs, yeah. actually. I mean, I do think we've been sort of zombies for a while when it comes to politics. Like, even getting involved in local elections. You know, actually, my friend Rebecca was here. She left early because she wanted to go to a Brookline, you know, local meeting, you know, and I'm like, that's great, but how many people who's, who are under the age of 65 do that, you know, like sit at these meetings that go on for hours, and these are actually where decisions get made that, rip, that have ripple effects too. So you have to go and sit at a really boring meeting that goes on for hours and listen to a bunch of people who might irritate you. And I think it, that, that's just gotta, you gotta do that, you know? Like you gotta go through tons of reports to figure out just as a journalist, you know, why do people report on Trump's tweets? Because it's such an easy story. Like if I sat at my computer, I could write that up in an hour. If I'm gonna go through a report and find three items that are really boring and then place four calls to figure out what they mean, and then, like, that's not gonna be a story I can write in a day. You know, like that's gonna, so that's an example. We have to just value those things. Um, and can I bring up something, Sharon? You were telling me something about the fact that it was really hard to get publicity about um, this book because so much of the news and the media was preoccupied with right. it. And that is right. terrifying itself. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, so the last time I did this book, I was on NPR a lot and Bloomberg and a lot of radio, but books generally are flat, flat lined. Um, in Boston, there's only, there were in the last month, I think, correct? There was only one story of culture on NPR here in Boston, 
and that was on country music, one. That's the reality of things. So there hasn't been, the media is not giving a voice to anything else, not to culture. It's not, so the value's going down too from that because they're not emphasizing it right now. They're just talking about what's happening in politics. Yeah, and then if you look at like Washington Post hired a whole bunch of new journalists, none of them were arts journalists. You know, it's like, and you start seeing the New York Times cuts their arts coverage, and it's sort of like it's becoming the, um, it's being whittled, you know, right. whittled down. Right, yeah. whittled out. Yeah. There's a question here, yeah, please. And then we'll go in the back. Uh, so. Yeah, I, I'll, I guess I'll try to make it brief because you really sort of 80% just addressed it in the last five minutes. Sorry. <laughs> 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 I, I mean, what I see, I'm not really involved in art. I was interested in it for a while. Uh, what I see in America now is the result of two things, concentration of wealth and cultural wars. Cultural wars you know, that have been waged for 40 years, and their whole purpose is to divide the country in two. You guys are the poster child, poster children of the enemy in the cultural wars. Uh, and I don't, and, and I don't, uh, that's an overgeneralization, but I, you know, this is, I feel like I'm on Facebook now. And, you know, everybody, I agree with their sentiments, what they want for the country, but, but then, then I see a map of the United States with a bunch of blue in the California, Massachusetts, all blue, and then I see this ocean of red, and that red is partly the result of a few mistakes in the Constitution, but it's partly a, a true cultural divide. And what I'm hearing from you is you're as puzzled as everybody else uh, you know, in the blue side as to what the hell to do with this cultural divide. So not, when not you say puzzled. we, when you, when you say we, <laughs> and the puzzled. people, and the public, and the audience, you mean people that you're used to talking to. I, I, prove me wrong, I would love it, but I don't hear you having a strategy to talk to the other half of the country. No, I'm totally positioning myself, especially on this tour, to rural areas that actually, I mean, I was just, in addition to, uh, well, I went to Tel Aviv, which has its own problems, but then Kalamazoo College, which is really small in, Mich in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and then Georgia Southern University, uh, which is an hour and a half outside of Savannah, really small, farmland everywhere from them exchange and give to them different models of sustainability. I think the key is to go out out of our bubbles into these rural areas. I need to know who these people are. I think that's one solution. I think it's also being open to different discourse and conversation, not to be defensive. I mean, sure, I'm not talking to my mother right now. There's other issues with that. But, <laughs> but I think that, I mean, of course, but and actually she knows me and there's all, I mean, it's TMI, TMI, it's too much. But I think that aside from that, I think the bigger issue is that divide and conquering that divide. I'm positioning myself in those places that I'm uncomfortable. And that is what a lot of people can do, is that try to put yourself in a place where you don't know that person, that you can offer and say, how can I help you? That you can be a generous giver, that you can offer, offer different solutions, and then hear them. I think a big part of it is listening, too. That's one solution. Uh, I would approach it a slightly different way, uh, and that, that doesn't go against that idea, but, but another side of it I see is that can we build a better story on the non-Trump side that explains how we're actually gonna help the red people more than the, the the people who are in office now. And we're seeing this with healthcare, uh, we're seeing this with what the, what the changes can happen with social security, with cutting education funding, arts funding, all sorts of stuff. Um, but that, that if we can get our, you know, I, I would say our side together to the extent that we're, we're the enemy, uh, that, that, that that's the project. You know, that's another way to reach those. Folks. Because I, I always feel like we share a lot more than we don't. That's why this 99% idea is very interesting to me. My Republican friends and, and relatives, they want better schools, right? They want better hospitals. They want better health care. I mean, there's a lot of things that we completely agree on. The path to get there is totally different. It makes no sense to me. But, but if we say, well, I want a better opportunities for my children, you know, I think we, we share a lot. And so 
I, I think there's a whole, it's gonna take all hands on deck, but, but part of it for me is, is also pulling together a, a more comprehensive story of change and possibility and hope again. But I think, can I just say, I think it's problematic when you say to help them. I think that's problematic. Well, to help everyone. But, well, right, but it's I'm problematic to say to a liberal, the poor, right. right, a liberal to say help the conservative. I mean, I, th I think that's a problem word because I don't think that some of those people necessarily need that they need that, that they need help. They think that they need help. We may think they need help, but that's 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 sort of condescending in a lot of ways because they're in their own place. We don't know what they're what they're struggling with. And some, some people can't identify with them. I think a big thing is to get to know what they're, what they're struggling with and who they are. Can I add one thing? There's a real barrier, though, that I feel exists, at least I can speak to that personally, and that is about the attitudes towards race, gender, yeah. and religion, and the, the enormous amount of bigotry that is separating our country. And that's the, those are the culture wars. And I think that that really creates um, a, you know, a barrier and inhibits that dialogue tremendously. How do you get beyond that? And uh, that, I'm just throwing that out as a question at the moment. I try to work with it in my class. I have Trump supporters. I have, you know, non-Trump supporters, and I'm trying to create empathy. I'm trying to listen to their side in my little microcosm. But I think it's it's hard to get over. I have just one comment in terms oh, of that. Yeah. Do you do you remember the far right reaching out to the left? when Obama was in power? Or like, you know, like that didn't happen either. You know what I mean? Like, I just think we want people to, ch but it's really about galvanizing people and bringing them to the polls and all these types of things and just making sure they're not disenfranchised. I think that's part of it, do you know? And I think we should concentrate somewhat on that and not just worry about convincing that, you know, one voter in that well, district. Or I, if, if I can speak, I don't know if you can hear me, but. I can hear you. That, that is, I, I think you're getting, I think you've gotten to the absolute core of the question. There's the image of the bridge, there's the image of the reaching out, there's the image of, of somehow we will diffuse something good into the nation, uh, all the nation. And the other one is, we are at war, and, and how do we win the war? I, I think people have to decide. Fair enough. That's an interesting <laughs> comment. Let's, we have probably have time for just a, uh, I see two. There's two, one two back questions. here, two that wanted to speak, and one in the back. So let's do one, two, three. That's probably what we have time for. And then there, the, we're going to be around, milling around. There's books to be sold, and we can continue the discussion afterwards. Let's try to get a couple uh, comments. Maybe we get the last three comments yep. all together, and then we'll, we'll have our, our final comments. Okay? I think we should probably we're gonna have time on that. Great. Okay, I'll be really yeah, David, yeah, I'm David Odo from the Harvard Art Museums. Um, I was really interested um, by everything you've said tonight. But Julia, you mentioned in particular um, that artists can go out and you know join other pro or uh, learn from other communities. And you mentioned Black Lives Matters in particular, and I think that really speaks a lot to the problems, of, of course, with the election, but the and this idea of bubbles. Um, and I wonder if you see artists, if any of you see artists right now reaching out in that way as well, because I think the racial and ethnic identity issues are really a huge problem in the art world as well. Let's, yeah, so let's, let's hold these questions. No, yeah, so it was, oh, we got one over here. Yep. Is this a woman up here and then a woman in the back? So, okay, we'll get all four questions. Uh, okay. Mine's really quick. Um, I'm Natalie Pangaro, I'm a designer married to an artist. Um, I, um, I really appreciate your uh, synthesis down to the two pieces because I think it brings back to what Paul said, which is that we're having this um, two hour long conversation and we don't know, we have an agenda, we know what we're doing, we have strategies and things like that, but if this was a different, um, if this was a group of reds, <laughs> the conversation would be very different. And I think that it just comes down to um, um, an ideological difference in how um, the strategy is created. We could all probably think of numerous examples that if the party were different, how the opposing party would have acted, because that happened a lot during Obama's administration. So I just think, if, again, I think you brought it right to a head. Are we in a bridge or are we at war? So in the back, did you have one? Yeah, there's one in the back. And then you're here too. Yeah, so the, yeah, okay. Back and we'll come back. I'm Heidi Lang, I'm with TheEditor.com, and um, one of the things 
it's exciting when we look at how, as journalists also, we start bridging stories from the middle of the country, from the sort of liberal coastlines. Um, the thing that stands up to me with the arts today is that so much of it is commoditized. And when you see people going to whether it's Art Basel or another uh, big show, and they're all very glamorous, and it's the same big artists who are making these gazillion dollars from hedge funds and venture capitalists, I, I don't see how we talk to the middle of the country about how um, how artists are here to protest. Um, and I wonder, I wonder if there's a way for us to look at who buys art as artists um, and only allow people to buy the art from us if they're doing reputable things with their corporations. The way you now have these stock po portfolios that people will only invest in if it has um, you know, companies that are doing good. And I feel that some of this frenzy, I know that we have artists need to be paid as journalists for making no money right now. Um, and so the revenue models aren't there. And so, you know, there's this machine that feeds all these artists. And I, I you know, I know curators are taking, you know, very wealthy people down to buy this art. And you think, oh, that's good because it's paying for artists. But I think it's creating this <coughs> bifurcation between the middle of the country who can, you know, ever even think of participating in that. And then when we try and wax on as liberal media, or I would guess as artists, you know, to have a conversation with them. The, the, the bifurcation is just too wide. So my question is, how are you looking at selling art to people that somehow, you know, gets it away from this commoditization of the Jeffrey Coons huge piece by the hedge fund guys that all own it? Thank you very much. And one last question, woman here at the black. Yes. Okay. Yes. There we go. Um, really quickly, in terms of Bill Could you George, introduce yourself to oh, no, no, no. my name is Lisa Nold. I work at MIT. I'm also a writer, artist. Um, in terms of the building bridges thing, what I find really works is you have to find what you both share mm -hmm. in common outside of politics. What is it that you love? And, and connect there. And then don't even bring politics at first, and then work from there. You have to work from, we share something together before you go anywhere else. That's just my personal experience. But um, my question and comment is that at MIT, we're thinking a lot about artificial intelligence, mass automation, and the future economies that are, are going to emerge. Um, from all that auto automation and robotics and stuff. And um, I was recently in a short course where I was speaking on behalf of fine arts in a room of technologists. And um, I can't emphasize enough how important it is for us to be aware of how fast automation is advancing. And while we're in this disquieting political moment, at the same time, automation is accelerating so fast, and um, it, it's not just the replacement of drivers and cars and things like that. They're, at Bloomberg, um, writers are being uh, replaced. There are actually robots writing some of the stories there, um, and that's happening in a lot of different publications. So um, I just want to say it's very important to be aware of that as artists and to communicate with those technologists in that community because um, I was bringing up things that just really didn't occur to them because at this point, you know, computers can write symphonies, you know, and computers can create art. Of course, as artists, we don't see that uh, as, as, as purely breathing human art, but a lot of technologists do. So uh, it's kind of a question and a, and a comment. I, I know we're not going to get to all <laughs> solve all these problems, but let's, let's have a, each of the panelists give something okay. to close with. I'll just go up to a quick one because I want to address the question that you first asked, and maybe I'll reiterate what I said. But I think the only way that our communities can come together is by taking the initiative to reach out to each other. Um, one example is that I went. There was a fashion show in Soho, not Soho, sorry, um, Lower East Side, called. <laughs> called illegal fashion. And I found myself in a community that was completely different from my own. It was a phenomenal demonstration. It happened during Fashion Week. 
uh, one group of women from the Middle East, and they were from different Middle Eastern countries, uh, each dressed up with a different headscarf that represented a different country, one of the seven countries in which people were banned from, so Sudan and Yemen. Uh, and they just, you know, walked down the fashion way. It was one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. And another woman made dresses that had to do with illegal immigration. Another one had to just, you know, had t-shirts on that said, um, we're about Juarez and El Paso and so forth and so forth. And I realized that my world was completely separate from these communities' worlds and that if I didn't go there, I wouldn't have had any knowledge of it. Similar to that, I feel that in We Make America, it's a very white organization. We cannot expect that if we just invite someone from Black Lives Matter to come, that they're going to come. No, that's not going to happen. We need to go and listen to other communities and to other organizers, and we need to go you know, out ourselves. And that's the only way we're going to bring communities uh, together. I'm going to address the art fair question. Dying to talk about that. Perception is really different than reality. I'll just say that first. So I think that a lot of things are traded, a lot of money is traded at art fairs, but the Jeff Koons, the, um, the big money that's, that's being uh, a big artist that are, are, are making a lot of money are very few, very few. If you go to the art fairs, you'll actually see some people from the Midwest, from all parts of the country. Um, I, I think that uh, also when oftentimes, um, and I'm, I'm sure Paul and Eva and many artists can talk about this too, is that um, even though the, the artist is showing at Art Basel, they may not ever be selling their work. Like the work may not be sold. So I, I think that ha there has to be something of a little bit of care of seeing that not just, just because they're in an art fair, these artists doesn't make them, and you didn't say this, but I'm just gonna say, any more successful than somebody who, as you're saying in the Midwest, who's not in that art fair. So I just think that but it's often- find, find public space for it, because to go to Miami the first week of December, you have to be a wealthy person to go to that. So make it, use the internet, use, I mean, I just think that- What do you mean you have to be wealthy for, the, to for artists to participate in that? Well, there are ways you can do that, though. I mean, if you want to be a part of it, but I don't know if artists really need to go there either. That a lot of dealers say that an art fair is not a, uh, a, the best place for an artist to be there anyway. It's not a place for exhibition. It's a place for selling work. So I don't actually see a lot. Of, I go there because I guest blog for Two Coats of Pain and I have meetings and I conduct my own business, but actually I don't really attend the fairs. I just see people who are there so I can move business, move towards getting projects done. So I actually don't find it to be that necessary, really. Although I do think art fairs are necessary for because collectors do buy work at them more than they do in the galleries. In the galleries. A, lot of art, a lot of collectors don't go to the galleries anymore, they go to art fairs. Um, I, treat, I treat art fairs like trade fairs. You know, I go there to have meetings and this type of thing and just sort of see what people are selling or thinking they're selling or whatever displaying. So, I mean, it's not really that important for a critic to be there. I mean, so I will sort of reiterate that. So I think the PR machine has really made us all think, or at least not all of us, but like some of us think that that is the game, you know, and that's where you have to be it or not. And I don't think that's true at all, to be quite honest. Um, you know, and I know a lot of critics who just don't go or ever have gone. You know, I mean, I spoke to Randy Kennedy at the New York Times, journalist. He's never been to Art Basel, Miami Beach. Do you know? He's like a major arts journalist. But that's that's not that uncommon. So the, then let's wa ask why you have that perception, or why are people having that perception, and where where the hell is that coming from? You know, it comes from sort of a media that likes to like fawn over these kind of celebrity transactions and perceptions of wealth and affluence and all these types of things. But to also address the issue of community, I think it's, um, I think the arts community is really robust. It's much more diverse than we think, but the reality is, and I like what Julia said about 
that those communities are not interacting. I mean, there are whole arts communities in this country and networks that do their thing independent of government funding, independent of any kind of mainstream acceptance, and they've been going on forever. Do you know, and I think uh, a perfect example that some of you may know is like the LGBTQ community. You know, it's like for decades that community, you know, uh, of which I'm a part of, uh, you know, has been creating its own culture and stuff independent of any kind of national support. And that's one of dozens of communities like that in this country. So how do we start getting those people in the same room? How do we start going to the events where we are uncomfortable? So I often say I'm part of three communities at the same time. I don't feel like there's one art community. Do you know? Even though there's a certain community that likes to rep represent itself as a mainstream art community. And I'll just say one thing too. If the, I think artists always want validation, which I think is very normal and important. And I think that some artists want that validation of being in that Art Basel art fair, right? But if they're not getting that validation there, the best thing for them to do is to create an opportunity that is new and from where they are and to be able to get it out there. Because actually, I know a lot of galleries and museum people who are more interested in that than what they're seeing in the art fairs. I think galleries and museums, and I'm not speaking for a the museum friends are always interested in the new thing and not something that's been done over and over and over again or part of the system. So I think artists are leaders in that way. So it takes a lot of guts and it takes some innovation and confidence for an artist to be able to, to uh, cultivate their community to create that opportunity where they are. I really want to thank everyone for this. It's really been a fascinating conversation. I'm thinking about bridges and battles, uh, <laughs> but also the ways that uh, the questions here have really added a lot uh, to this conversation. And thank you for that. And finally, thank, thank you to our panelists, Sharon Loudon, Brian Martini, and Julia Thank you all. Thank, 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 thank you, everyone. Thank you. The books are available, and we're available for more conversation, too. Thank you very much.